Thank you. I just put it down in the chat. <clears throat> so I'm right now doing a radio show with my colleagues in the UK on North Carolina. I know many people in Asheville. I was in Asheville a few months ago. Um, so I know a lot of people have survived and the, and despite lack, government, lack of government accountability, how can people um, outside the government, well, I'm seeing that they're, they're thriving because they have community and they have like helicopters and everything. And they showed up when the government didn't. However, I'm also seeing um, that, um, However, um, what might have happened in North Carolina might have been a land grab for lithium um, with the DOD. Um, that's what Dane Wigginton said when he met with um, members of Congress in the Carolinas and Tennessee. And the, the idea is that possibly the, the weather can be controlled. And I don't know if that's true. I don't know if it's not true. Um, but it is uh, the, the lack of um, FEMA not going through to rescue the people. It's concerning. And I want to know what we can do um, because there have been a lot of weather anomalies and um, feeling of, I don't want us to feel like we're victimized and at the mercy of these corporate greedy corporations or government interests or whatever interests there are. So I'm interested in what you talked about, that rabbi who had that practice, and what we can do um, to shift the energy, and what is that rabbi's name who did that practice? I'd like to know how we can take back the feeling of empowerment, um, because I'm, now I'm wondering when the next shoe is going to drop. Mm -hmm. um, okay, yeah, get the picture. Thank you, Sarah. The name of the rabbi is not important. The people who are doing this kind of work are not public. Um, there's a, a different, a different uh, hierarchy <laughs> and power structure operating in this world than we can see through the lens of politics and fame and prominence. Uh, but as to your question about the, you know, the weather control, the land grab, all that kind of stuff, um, we have to be careful of this constant invitation to victim mentality that invites us to locate the source of our problems in the person of, you know, some evil actor, some conscious entity could be what one person could be a group of people could be a corporation could be something that we can name the government. Because what that does, it it, well, for one thing, it simplifies the complex problem. It erases other causes. It casts us into a world where we are the victims of super powerful evil villains. It obliterates all of the messiness of human affairs where, where incompetence, groupthink, uh, bureaucratic paralysis, uh, uh, foolishness, um, chaos, you know, the unexpected, like all these things are, you know, erased when you say, well, it's just, you know, evil people controlling the weather. The weather itself is not so easy to control. It's a nonlinear, highly nonlinear system where you try to make it do one thing and it'll do the opposite because you cannot predict what's going to happen. So in the case of, you know, these weather anomalies being caused by weather control technologies, okay, but what about the influence of the destruction of coastal wetlands? What about the influence of uh, the denuding of landscapes through failure to, to plant cover crops, which create uh, high pressure zones, which push the rain into the mountains? You know, is that was that intentional? Did somebody say, okay, we're gonna, uh, you know, change agricultural practices so that you know, thirty years later there'll be unstoppable storms that we can get the lithium mines? Like, you know, our our uh, our as change agents requires that we understand the full situation. These narratives of of find the bad guy. Here's the bad guy. They blind us to the full situation. 
Therefore, they disempower us. And, and it's weird because it seems like they empower us because they say, okay, here's the problem. Now you know what the problem is. Now you understand what to do about it, <laughs> even though you're powerless to do anything about it because you're not as powerful as Bill Gates, you know, or George Soros or whoever, who George Soros, who's actually like a doddering 85-year-old man, <clears throat> you know, like we, we impart superpowers to these people and, and think that they're playing 4D chess. They're not any more intelligent or competent or foresightful than anybody else. They are just like everybody else, reacting to one thing after another after another. Yeah, maybe they have plans that constantly fail. It's there's no so so. Please resist this. The all of these invitations to simplify the world, especially when it simplifies it into um, a victim narrative. Well, I appreciate. I really appreciate that. Sorry, the, the sun came in. It's really messing with my video, but I'm afraid to move my computer or I'll lose my internet. Um, so it's the sun. <laughs> yeah, beautiful. We like that. We like the sun. <laughs> Makes little rainbow streaks on your picture. Yeah, it's really, really interesting. That's so interesting. I'm, I've been really just trying to. I've been struggling with this big time. You know, just like again, how to how to feel resilient. Um, because it's not just what happened in Asheville. It's, it's like oh, yeah. how to feel like, um, oh, wow, you can just build something up and then some, someone with the power can just take it away at any moment if they feel your land is valuable. That's the message that's being put out there. Yeah. And, and they, you know, I think a lot of it, I mean, I think that there is a land grab, you know, it's, it's opportunistic, you know, the, 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 the way is clear, and now what would have been really hard is becomes much easier. So there are, you know, very ruthless, greedy, opportunistic forces that, but, but to, to look at it all as a giant master plan, you know, that, that is um, not helpful. No, not no, helpful. It, is, it is. I it did feel what Dane Winkington said did have some credence. I mean, he, and, and I looked up, this morning, and there is research about weather modification. Uh, there's actually there are actually oh, yeah. papers, and 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 actually they talk about China. There's actually and uh, Cambridge University Press has something, I believe, and uh, and there's ch about China saying they have this abil this ability. So I'm seeing that here you have um, this, these presentations by this guy who is a um, um, uh, what is it? A weather, a weather forecaster, and he, and and he he did this in 1972. He he actually has all these references, and then at the same time, you see the Guardian saying, "Oh no, this this has been politicized because the people in the red states are saying that yeah. they've had this weather so um, due to being a okay, red so state." Okay, so let me talk about weather modification. All right, the, it's been yeah. a, a you know scientific dream for at least a hundred years. You know, is naturally because when you look at the world as as a mechanism, as a machine, as an engineering object, then of course the ambition will be to to bring everything wild. I mean, this is actually thousands of years old. This is the ascent of humanity, the um, the the which it's a myth, a mythology that says that the destiny of the human being is to become the lords and masters of, of creation. So part of that. To, to have godlike powers. So it once was Zeus, you know, or Thor or whoever, you know, who <laughs> controlled the weather. Now it's going to be us. So this has been a, a scientific, you know, and pre-scientific ambition for a long time, a conceit. Of course, if, if the world is indeed an engineering object, then yes, we will be able to, to engineer the weather to make the weather better because it's just a bunch of random stuff with no, no real intelligence there. Intelligence is here with me, with us, with humans, not out in the wild, not out in the world. Uh, and our powers to modify are unlimited. And we're marching past one frontier after another. We've conquered the atom. You know, we're, we're, we're pushing past the final frontier of space and the deep oceans and the human body, the genome. We're going to modify everything, the brain chemistry. We're going to engineer it to make it perfect. So, of course, the weather is part of that ambition. So, of course, science in its arrogance and hubris is going to try to do that. Problem is, 
the world is not actually a mechanical contraption devoid of intelligence. And our efforts, when we treat it as such, there's always unexpected consequences. There's always blowback. It can, and in fact, it's like the Sorcerer's Apprentice, the Disney movie, you know, you, you unleash that and it just, the, the, the unintended consequences multiply out of control and you can barely deal with them. It happens again and again and again. You know, oh, let's genetically modify this plant to introduce this new trait into it. Well, yeah, you can do that, but the the genome then compensates in a hundred other ways for that modification, and it produces all kinds of unexpected consequences. And the same thing with, with you know, pharmaceutical medicine. Same thing with genetic interventions in the human body, like, you know, the gene therapy, the mRNA vaccines. I mean, all this stuff has unintended consequences because of the nonlinearity and the, the livingness of the world. So they might try, but do not um, do not succumb to the ideology that says that the world is such that those attempts will be successful. They will produce more and more chaos. However, now I want to add one more thing, one more ingredient to the pot. I heard uh, someone was telling me about a, uh, a sun dance that they conducted, um, a, a tribal person here in North America. And they had, um, and it was looking like they might not have sun because there were these big storms, you know, coming. But they had, uh, a shaman there, um, I think he was from South America, who spent those four days doing ceremonies to keep the rain away so that they could have their sun dance. There is actually weather control that actually works, but it's not what we think it is. It is not control, actually, but it is a, a conversation with the living beings of the elemental beings uh, that that create weather. And they may or may not agree to the request issued by those who know how to speak with them. But there are many, many stories like this. And those who engage in these practices know very well that you invite some weather here, you're taking it away from somewhere else. And they are very respectful. So when, so in a way, all of these ambitions of technology, they are substitutes for other types of technology, which really maybe shouldn't even use the same word for them. Other capacities of humans in cooperation with nature, with other than humans, you know, that, that, you know, like our, what we're doing right now, we're communicating by video over a distance. That would have seemed like magic, uh, you know, a couple hundred years ago, even a hundred years ago. And do we need technology to do that? Some of what I'm exploring now is communication networks that are not based on this kind of technology and that are actually much more intimate. They're not as certain. You don't get the same kind of instant confirmation that it's actually happening. You can't control it as well. It's not control. But there's, so, so, In a way, you could say that that what we see, what we know of technology as technology is an imitation or a striving toward something that is actually innate to the human being and has been known and practiced.
for tens of thousands of years. That doesn't mean that technology is bad or useless and that we should get rid of it. But the changes that we are preparing for require that we not be limited to technology and the mindset beneath it and the stories that contain it about how change happens in the world and how cause and effect work. So when you take these other realms, these other capacities into account, there's no place to feel victimized by these weather control people, these, you know, powers that are trying to grab the land. Well, I'm, 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 I'm sitting with it. I'm sitting with the, the, the very strange coincidence because I heard the people who are, who the people in the communities around the lithium mines were a roadblock and didn't want to sell the land to developers. And I also heard this in Lahaina. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm, so I'm, I'm sitting with this and no doubt, yes, the earth is a living organism and no doubt, I bet we, we can, I, people had meditations to lower the cat storm level of Milton. Mm -hmm. No doubt that probably was effective. I, I, you know, cause they, they've done meditations <clears throat> on world peace and then crime has been lowered in cities. Um, but I, I, something, the coincidence of the people resistant to lithium mining and then it, the hurricane centering, the eye, I believe, centered on it. Yeah, but, but listen, listen, Terry, there are, no matter where you go, there are lands that, that people want to grab, whether mm. it's for a lithium mine or for something else. Mm. Good point. You know, there's a book published maybe 20 years ago, A Paradise Built in Hell uh, by Rebecca <laughs> Solnit. And it talks about, it gives all these examples of natural disasters or man-made disasters and how community like springs to life when this happens. So if it happens in your community, I bet people will do the same thing. This is what human beings want to do. But, you know, when all of our needs are met through money and technology and don't require each other, then, you know, what is there to do? There's no community then. Very good point. Yeah. Thank you. This is really a lot to absorb, and I'm so grateful you took the time because um, we're going to have a meeting later with the radio show people just to process mm -hmm. where we're going to go with the show. Thank you. Yeah, good. I'm glad it was useful, Sarah. <clears throat> yeah. Thanks.